Welcome to the Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries and Founders Exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. And I'm Tom Askell, and I'm delighted to be here today with my good friend, Dr. Tom Nettles. So, Tom, welcome to the Sword and Trial. My pleasure to be here. Thank it's good, you. Good to have you here. I watch it and I envy the people that get to be on here. And so now I are one of them. You are one. Well, no, you're here all the time, actually, because just over my left shoulder is the <laughs> the image of the only living man that surrounds uh, our environs here in the studio. Wow. So that's a, a portrait your son did years ago. I'm sure you remember Surrounded that. by B.H. Carroll and Charles Spurgeon and Andrew Fuller and William Carey. Yeah. Man, these are some of your best friends. They are, yeah, they are. <laughs> the people you know well. Well, uh, you're in town to teach a uh, second part of a church history course mm-hmm. for the Institute of Public Theology, of right. which you are a founding faculty member. And How so, about that? Yeah, yeah, so it's just great to have you here. And I uh, hear the first day's lectures went really well. Uh, students came out with uh, their eyes bleeding, understanding that there's <laughs> things that they don't know that they need to know. And uh, no, I heard great yeah. comments from the guys that well, sat in the classes. Well, they're, they're an enthusiastic group, and they ask really good questions. Mm. They read the textbook, and they compare lecture to text and ask really, I think, pertinent questions about that. Mm. And so I'm enjoying it. It's a good exercise for these guys. And yeah. they seem to really appreciate the opportunity yeah. to have this kind of more formalized study in areas yeah. that they know are important, but they just hadn't been able to to put themselves to it. Yeah, I've been greatly encouraged with uh, the caliber of students that the Lord has brought, and we've just received several new applications for new students, and mm-hmm. I think some of those are actually tuning in online that couldn't get here. Uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged with IOPT. If you want more information on that, you can go to the Institute of Public Theology.org and uh, find out more about Dr. Nettles there and the courses he's teaching and the things that are coming up uh, in the latter part of this year, the rest of this year. we got Jim Renahan next week Good. coming in to teach Wonderful. Baptist Symbolics with uh, his new book. He probably knows it better than anybody. I agree. I yeah. agree. I mean, his book is its just a lifetime it of research coming out. And, and coming out after his one on the first London Confession, yeah. where he did a great job of tying it in to broader theological categories, and then that being the precursor to yeah. this one is just is perfect. Yeah, it, it is good. I'm, yeah. I'm just just thrilled with what God's doing in assembling the faculty and bringing the students that he is. I think it bodes well for the future. Well, Tom, I'm interested in hearing you talk about uh, your approach to history, how you think about understanding history, how you think about how we should think about history. I've, I've heard this before. We've talked about it some, yeah. and it's been different from other uh, historians that I've talked to and listened to. Uh, you have a particular understanding of the way Christians should think about history. So would you mind uh, laying that out for us? Yeah, well, I've, I've been acquainted with the sort of the guild of historians for a good while and have read things that they've written about <clears throat> historiography and how the Christian historian should be able to commend himself to secular historians that any judgments he made should be built on the same kinds of facts that a secular historian would have. And I think that to a large extent that is true. We can't go against the sources. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's a very good discipline to have. But uh, I also think that we realize that God has a purpose in this world, that this, his purpose is to glorify his son, and that he has revealed truths to us that will eventually reign in, this, in the universe. And he's given us the Bible by which we see how history develops. Uh, we see prophecies given at certain times. We don't know how they're going to come out. And then we see them unfold. Uh, and the inspired writers describe them. This is that which was said and, and that kind of thing. And so we recognize that there are, there are things that God inserts in history. And in, in the process of, of historical development, it may, it's not prophecies now, but nevertheless, it's things that relate to his intention. And then we can see them unfold later. Mm-hmm. And I think the Christian historians should be open to that and should be willing to say, if this had not happened here, then perhaps it would not have happened later. But it happening here was a matter of God's providential arrangement that it would be sort of an idea that is present mm-hmm. within the whole intellectual climate of history. And then all of a sudden it, it, it comes up here again, just like you can't understand Luther without understanding his interaction with scholastic theology, his disputation against scholastic theology, and his 
coming to see that some of the things the scholastic theologians spoke against were things that were considered heresy in the, their days, but now he sees them as, as truth, like, like a focus on the Scripture to the exclusion of papal interpretation. Mm-hmm. Luther wouldn't have done that in his early days as a monk, <clears throat> but once he begins to engage that, that's something he embraces. That, mm-hmm. that is something that becomes a part of, of the fabric of his whole Reformation. Uh, and so I think that when we see something like that in the, in the Lollards or in the Waldensians or uh, even in some other dissenting groups, that becomes a, a part of the whole fabric, the intellectual fabric of, of history, the spiritual fabric. And these ideas kind of hang around. And I think we can say God providentially was preparing the world to receive this. It is seen as, by a small group, it is seen as right and good and a part of their discipleship. It's seen by the larger developing churches as something that is to be repressed, as something that is heretical. Uh, But then when these changes begin to occur in Luther or in in Calvin or in, in Zwingli, there are certain parts of that heretical fabric that existed before that now they see, oh, this mm-hmm. is this is right. I don't think it's wrong for us to see those things as, as providentially mm-hmm. uh, arranged. Mm-hmm. And there are any number of things that could uh, could happen like that because uh, if, if we don't allow providence <clears throat> to be an element of history, then we are we're denying the way the Bible approaches history. Mm. Uh, we are looking at things that, um, if, we look, if we, we look at the Old Testament, just look at the book of Judges. We look at the way God dealt with Israel in the book of Judges and certain things that happen in the book of Judges that seeming are, are insignificant events, but then uh, it, it turns out to be a thing that is, that is true. And it was, it was put in there, back there in this little event, but God in his providence worked it out. Like the killing of Sisera by J.L. When... <clears throat> Oh, one of the judges said, I, I can't go. Deborah, you got to go with me. you got to do this. And so she says, well, the woman's going to get a, the, the glory for this. And, of course, everyone's thinking, oh, Deborah. Deborah's going to really do something great. Well, she's there, and she does. But it's not Deborah. It's yeah. this housewife that's sitting by herself in her house that drives a, a, pent, a, a tent peg. And so that, that's a providential Thing. God is the one that arranged that, made this guy, he was running off, he's hungry. Uh, this woman offers him a place to have some, some milk. He says, just give me some water. She gives him <laughs> milk. He goes to sleep. You know, and why does that happen? Why, why does Deborah turn out to be un, uh, understand that's going to happen? Mm. Well, that's, that's providence. Yeah. That's, that's the way God works. And that's just a small event that occurs like within a 24-hour period or something. But then we need to see large events in the same way. And uh, I don't think it's wrong for a Christian historian to, to look at these and say, if we take a biblical view, if we see the way God works in history, if we really believe that God works all things after the counsel of his own will, we have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. It is not wrong for us to investigate the ways of God and how he works out the counsel of his will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can see the Reformation because we believe the truth of Scripture, because we believe the doctrines that came out of the Reformation, I think we can look and we can see how providentially God was, was moving toward that moment. How did he prepare Luther? Uh, why did Luther fall off the horse and pledge to be a monk and go in there and, and, and had such emotional problems that Staupitz assigned him to be the teacher of Bible at, at Wittenberg? Well, these, uh, <laughs> don't we have an insight into that and say this is God's providence? Yeah. He enforced him to be uh, conversant with Scripture day in and day out. He assaulted his conscience with Scripture. Isn't that what Scripture does? Mm. So, I mean, these are, these are just things that if we, we look at the Bible, I don't think it's wrong for us to bring in this and say, this doesn't justify everything that happened. Men right. are still sinful, but we still we can see that this is God's providence. Yeah. So I don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to, in any sense, abuse the facts or ignore the facts. And I want all historical interpretation to be built on the facts. And there are plenty of them, and there's plenty of room for correcting yeah. things where people have misunderstood in the past just simply through the facts. But it is also good to be able to discern that there, there are things that rise above just the facts, ma'am, mm-hmm. uh, to say, all right, God was at work. 
here. Yeah, I, and you know, <clears throat> the way you've articulated that, I think, applies way beyond the discipline of historiography as well. Uh, because part of the facts is that there's a God in heaven who is ruling and reigning. That's right. He's working all things after the counsel of his will. Yeah, and if you don't acknowledge that, well, then you're actually denying or setting aside as unimportant that key fact that begins in Genesis 1-1. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I think we see this God going on. God created the world with a purpose. Yeah. And, and it's culminated. I, and I wonder <clears throat> if uh, the lack of that point of view that you just articulated with regard to thinking about history, I wonder if that's permeated so deeply into our evangelical world today that it makes uh, some evangelicals prone to just buying into the cancel culture. Because you look at facts and you say, oh yeah, that's a bad thing there. Therefore, boom, over, done with. And yeah. you forget, no, there's a God in heaven. Joseph's yeah. brothers should be canceled because yeah, of what they right. did. But God was using even their wicked sin uh, to David, bring... David God. should be canceled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just keep going, you keep yeah. going. And, and yet when you look at the cross... Moab should be canceled. <laughs> Where do you get Ruth? Yeah, exactly. Well, so, <clears throat> and, and the... The cross, the cross in my mind, is well, just I mean, like that's, the Well, I mean, that's true. And don't we teach our people to do that? And don't we expect it to be a true thing when they investigate their lives in light of God's providence? Isn't this yeah. what we teach them when we say Romans 8, 28? Oh, yeah. you've got to find God's good in this. He works all things together for good to those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow. Mm -hmm. he, you know, we go on with this mm -hmm. and there's nothing light about that. Mm -hmm. That is insistent. Right. In Scripture. And so if we are to live life personally that are in tune with a joyful praise of God for whatever He brings into our lives, we have to believe in His providence and His goodness toward those whom He has put into Christ. Yeah, yeah. And the same way it is with the whole movement of history. It's not all these loose ends out here, and God's not concerned about any of that. It's just like an individual sanctification of individual people where He works. No, it's the whole thing. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and he's left sufficient evidence for us in Scripture that these things can be discerned because of the character of God, because of specific statements about the purpose of God. Do we think that William Carey's going to preach the gospel in India was a matter of, of providence that he worked mm -hmm. out in Carey's life and that he worked out in the life of Andrew Fuller and he put these people together? Can we say this was providential? He put all mm -hmm. the gifts together and he... Mm -hmm. This guy was willing to do it, and has that affected us today? Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are these are things that the believer should just should relish yeah. to, to see. And you don't look at those things and say, "Well, how serendipitous!" You know that it worked out that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, God was doing it to work out that way. Right. And exactly. Yeah. So I, I really do think that uh, you're a, a glorious and massive and beautiful uh, intelligence that has put the world into existence for the manifestation of his glory and he's working all things after the counsel of his will. And if God's people cannot discern some of it, shame on us. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. And what we don't understand, there's enough that we can understand that's been revealed right. to help us live by faith. Amen. In the midst Amen. of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we're challenged with both of these every day, aren't we? Sure. To yeah. say we, we, we rejoice in the providence of God and then we find mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And we and we don't we don't make it, let ourselves ask why why <laughs> oh I don't know if God is up for me anymore you know we don't do that but it is there is mystery sure there is so it, when we say why we are we're, we're it's an anticipation that he will make it clear yeah yeah and you, know? you again <clears throat> and for for me that the paradigm is the execution of Jesus on the cross I mean you look at that if you just take the facts and you forget there's a God in heaven yes yeah, the greatest evil that's ever been done you know it's the most horrible unjust act <laughs> yeah, yeah, ever that's the perfect paradigm yeah, yeah. and uh, yet this is god <laughs> doing it god's doing it and so if god was doing his deepest work of redemption in the most horrific miscarriage of justice in human history then that gives me pause and reason to be full of hope and to walk by faith when I don't understand all the stuff that's coming that's difficult for me, that's unjust, or that I see unjust, injustice, injustices in the world. I still know that this is the same God, yeah. same God who gave up his yeah. son. He, him being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you mm -hmm. have taken... And by wicked hands have crucified him. Yeah. You, we, we don't get off the hook just because of God's providence. That's right. And that's an, another amazing mystery. Yeah. But we sense it every day. We know it's true. Yeah. 
Yeah. Then we will try to put it all together and say, well, if God has determined it's going to happen, humans cannot be responsible. <laughs> and that's why we live by faith in the, in the, in the revelation of Scripture. That's right. And, yeah. and I just kind of come to terms with, you know, with the, that's just the way the world is. That's the way that God made the world. God's absolutely sovereign. We're absolutely responsible. You can't figure it out. Well, you know, you, you need to at least accept it because that's the only world we got. That's the one God created. Yeah. And we've got to live in this. And we know that he is absolutely just and that he will abide by his own character or he would never have sent his son. He would have just arbitrarily just said, okay, you guys don't need to worry about it. You're all forgiven. That's, yeah. that's, that's not the way it did. Right. He, he did it. That's not the way it could have been done. Right, right. And, uh, yeah. Well, this is helpful, Tom. I, I think, it, again, it goes way beyond just the study of history as a formal discipline to how we live our lives Christianly every yeah. day. <clears throat> but from that, what value is there and and what would you commend to Christians about understanding God's work in history for helping us live well today? I mean, what are, what are some, can you think of maybe some practical examples and you've already touched on some of these and big strokes, but um, how can a right, how can a right understanding of history help us to live well today and, and to be uh, properly hopeful toward the future? Well, I think there are are two ways. One is we can see the advantages that have come to us through beneficent providences, benevolent providences, and learn to appreciate them and and seek to sort of get in on them. Mm -hmm. Say, Mm -hmm. if if it was a rediscovery of the Word of God that brought about the Reformation, and if if the Reformation brought about certain changes in, in Western society. We don't need to look at that and say, oh, this is just some sort of systemic Western maleness that's coming in. It's, it's, it's not. We, we're, we're sinful Western white males and uh, are just as sinful as anyone. And the only explanation as to why certain cultures developed in one part of the world that didn't develop in another is because of the power of the Word of God and the Spirit implanting those things in the minds of people. It wasn't their ingenuity. It wasn't mm-hmm. any kind of intrinsic superiority. It was solely the human mind as altered by the truth of divine revelation mm-hmm. and, tra- and uh, that uh, whose power transfigured their thinking. And this brings about tremendous cultural changes with all of the harshness and all of the persecutions and all of the the burnings and so forth like that went on in England in the Reformation. Nevertheless, what's happening in the Reformation? You've got purification coming on. You've got Protestantism taking on a, a, a more purified form. You have the Puritans arising in that. You have the, re, the rejection of superstition that they had seen had taken over the church in many ways, though it It still had Orthodox Christology and understanding of sin and the necessity of the death of Christ, but so much superstition that clouded the gospel. And then that is what gives rise to the the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. The Enlightenment is a secular movement by and large, but it becomes possible to think rationally when you rid your mind of superstitions, Mm -hmm. when you Mm -hmm. begin to, to see that there is symmetry in, in the world, and it's the doctrine of the atonement. It is the doctrine of justification by faith that is so embedded within Western society that these things work in accordance with God's purposes. They work in accordance with God's character. Uh, imputation of righteousness is, is perfectly rational when you understand the worldview of, yeah. of the Bible. And so it taught people to think, read systematic theologies of the Puritans and see, man, that is some rigorous rational thinking. That is, that is some synthesizing of, of data that can mm-hmm. only be done when the mind is, is trained to think that way. And they, they find it in Scripture. They find it in the character of God. And so the Enlightenment was a rejection of a lot of the supernatural, but it is still a product of thought, rational mm. thought that was only made possible according to the Reformation. And when that combines then, if we, we want to say, that combines <clears throat> with a, another level of Puritanism in America, people like Roger Williams and Isaac Backus and John Clark, who want a stable and want a just society but recognize that you cannot use religion as a thing to impose on the consciences of people. You cannot persecute. You have to have liberty of conscience. 
And so rationalistic enlightenment people came and they combined mm -hmm. and, and produced a country that by and large has given people an opportunity for free living, for creativity, for uh, prosperity, for working in business, for, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, don't steal any longer, work with your hands that you may have something to give to those. It's, the, it's all of these uh, to those who are in need. Mm -hmm. and, and so you begin to see a, the, the meshing of, of biblical theology, Reformation theology, <clears throat> with a purified kind of uh, of I, I don't know what secular rationalism mm -hmm. not not the kind exactly that we have today but right. but nevertheless that to me that's providence to yeah. me that that's something that we can benefit from and we can say we need to protect that we we need to work as hard as we can to be salt and light we need to work as hard as we can to have honesty because that is a heritage that we have. We need to, to work as hard as we can to make sure we're preaching the gospel because we know that it is gospel truth that even if people who are not embracing it, nevertheless, they're so influenced by its rationality and by the, the kinds of people it produces that, that they're willing to, to say this is the way to live. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that, that's a positive thing mm -hmm. that, I, that I believe we should embrace, we should investigate it, we should seek to perpet, uh, perpetrate it in every way that we can. And then we also see um, destabilization. We see what begins to happen when these truths are lost. And we can look in history and we can see the sorts of havoc that were wrought within places and within cultures that did not have that sense of the overarching justice of God, that did not have that rationality mm -hmm. and that that sense of subduing the creation. They, they were overwhelmed by the creation. They, they, it was something that was mysterious to them. And superstition develops in many cultures simply because of that. But within a culture that believes that God is the creator and that we are to subdue the earth and that we're to live honestly and that we're to use all the things that God has given us to, to create a kind of life that will benefit our neighbors as well as us, that, that creates a culture that you want to to live in. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we're all going to die. And, mm -hmm. and if we live in an oppressive culture, we'll, we'll die anyway. But our hope is eternal life. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I think this is, since this is God's world, we seek to live in such a way as we avoid those errors. We avoid those things that destroy stability. We mm -hmm. seek to avoid those things that, that create uh, dishonesty uh, and rapaciousness uh, and uh, covetousness and all of that, we, we, and so the church has this obligation to, uh, to preach, to preach the truth, not only for eternal life, but for realizing that it will produce cultures in which there can be greater freedoms mm -hmm. for confronting the gospel and believing the gospel. Yeah. Uh, I just kind of rambled on. No, well, that, I'm, I'm, but, you got my mind spinning here because I think what I'm seeing today, it, it, I'd be interested in your take on this, is an effort to try to promote this enlightenment rationalism while the foundation of Christianity has been eroded. And I think we can see this even in our attempts to, to do nation building. You know, we go into Iraq and we're going to have this enlightenment yeah. rationalism that's going to make everybody yeah, love we're liberty. Yeah, import democracy. Yeah, in yeah. There. Just, okay, you take democracy. Yeah. That doesn't work. It, it can it's only built survive. It's a worldview exactly. that, is, that, is, that has centuries of talk that come out of the gospel. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so today, it's almost like, um, I mean, I, I read, uh, I think it was David French just in the last few days, talking about becoming more libertarian, you know, in his understanding of how to live in the world as a Christian in a pluralistic society. And I get that pull. I, I sense that in my own thinking, but it just seems to me to be completely irrational, given what you just said, yeah. that the, the rationalism <laughs> that was uh, given rise to from the Enlightenment was grounded in this reordering of understanding of the world. Was. Yes, And you take well, away that right order and try to maintain the rationalism. Well, there, it's feet firmly planted in midair, and it's going to spin off into whoever's the most powerful, whoever has the, the biggest stick to get everybody else to comply with those deductions. And that's where we are today. And uh, you know, I, I find myself more and more just being determined to stand on what I understand the Bible to speak foundationally and say, nah. -uh. <laughs> you can make your arguments. I don't care. You're not operating on the same foundation I am. 
Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I think that, that a capitulation to what you've described as libertarianism that, uh, that seeks to understand and to embrace culture out of some sense of compassion or out of some sense of trying to redirect it, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, even mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. but at the same time forsaking any kind of clear statement, any kind of visible commitment to as you talk about Genesis 1-1, mm-hmm. a world created by God for God's glory with God's own attributes built into it of consistency and symmetry and beauty and power and all these things. And if you don't understand God, you don't have any explanation for any of these. You don't have any explanation for, I think one of our, one of our friends talks about he believes in moral facts, mm-hmm. uh, but... Uh, not why? God. <laughs> yeah. Why? <laughs> so, so what? What are what are moral facts? What is that? That that means that you believe there are things that have independent existence outside of our opinions that are moral that to which we should conform. Where does that come from? Mm-hmm. You only have that if you believe in a God who created the world and gave us laws that are consistent with His nature. And so the the Spirit witnesses to this. There are some people who are thoughtful people and who have very good instincts, but somehow the philosophical climate, the scientific climate has made them think that it is more intellectually responsible not to try to explain things through God, and yet their spirit says, there's gotta be right and wrong. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's gotta be moral facts, yeah. but you don't have that. Just like you said a while ago, it's, if you don't have God, you don't have moral facts, you just got human opinion, you've got majority culture determining what is right and wrong mm-hmm. and you don't have any rights yeah. of the people who are in the minority yeah. and you're going to create a very uh, cruel destructive culture when you eliminate that reality yeah. and I think that's why the preaching of the gospel is so important that's why we cannot buy into all the cultural Things. We can't sort of jump on the bandwagon and start speaking their language and, and think that we're being compassionate when, when all of this is going on. To, 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 ignore, to ignore clear biblical passages about what the church is and what morality is uh, in, in the light of, of being compassionate or even, even in, in the, for the purpose of being evangelistic mm-hmm. or something, to ignore propositional revelation is just it's suicide. Yeah. Yeah. You you don't you may make yourself feel good for a while that you're being a compassionate person and you're understanding these. Uh, I know one of the prominent persons in evangelicalism uh, talks about compassion toward LGBT community, and of course we all want to be compassionate sure. in certain ways, yeah. but not to say you're okay. You're, right. you're, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. You love each other, yeah. and that's good. That's the that's the big Christian principle: is love each other. And they, I know all the clobber passages where you yeah. get First Corinthians and you get you get Romans one mm. and you get Ephesians and you get mm. uh, you get Revelation <laughs> saying that homosexuals are not going to enter the kingdom of God. But those are the clobber passages. Right. We want the big overarching compassionate passages. You can't pit scripture against that way. It, no. Against uh, I've, against well, no. each other. It's and, just and so anyway, this the corrupting effect. And we've talked yeah. about this. The corrupting effect. <clears throat> Of, of, of seeking to appear to be sensitive to, to loud voices in the culture will move us away from the very foundation that creates the kind of stability and the kind of compassion that we actually can live with. Right. And it's not compassionate. It's no. not loving. No. If I'm playing with a rattlesnake that will kill me and you try to make me feel good about my rattlesnake that I'm playing with, you're not loving you're me. You're having so much fun with that snake. <laughs> yeah, you're not loving me. You know, that's okay. That's, you, you can have your snake. You don't love me. You hate me. But no. you might be applauded by the world because look how gentle you're being with this man who thinks this rattlesnake's going to give him life. You know, I mean, but you're, you're actually hating me. No. And that's where I think we've lost it. We've, we've missed what the Bible calls love. We miss what the Bible calls mercy. And we have taken our cues from a, a culture that is going at breakneck speed away from the true God. Right. But we can't change the culture just by saying, well, we're going to create some stricter laws. It's, mm-hmm. it's always got to come from regeneration. It's got yeah, to come absolutely. from a, 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 
a leavening influence, a salt and light influence that the church has on culture right. and participating in it, running for office, being school teachers, going to universities, being scientists, being doctors, refusing to do abortions, uh, doing all of those things as salt and light because we believe the gospel to be true. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's what created the, the best parts of American culture. It's never been perfect, of course. Always things to mm-hmm. correct. But I, I do think that we probably agree that we are, we are seeing some sort of uh, p- peculiar corruption and decline now that we have not experienced until maybe the last 20 yeah, years. Yeah. It's, uh, it's gone at warp <laughs> speed, it seems like. What's yeah. been there, the seeds have come up and sprouted. And, and my great concern in this is that the church, we are that which Christ has instituted to proclaim the only message that can change lives. The only way, as you talked about, the regeneration only comes through the gospel. The gospel has been given to the church. My concern is that we have not handled the gospel well. We've not preached the gospel well because the gospel is good news for sinners. Yeah. And we don't yeah. want to call sin, sin anymore. We no. want to make excuses for lifestyles <laughs> and identifications and whatever anybody else might want to add to that. And if you don't have, no, this is what's right. This is what's wrong in that, in that sense. And these are the consequences. Yeah. And, and this is where it leads you. And this is what, who God is in, in that sense. We need a recovery of the preaching of the law of God, as well as the gospel of God, not the law to make people better, but the law to show the truth yeah. about Absolutely. why people need the savior. Bravo! Yes, well, I'm, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, the, the the threefold uh, use of the law. I, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think you and I have talked about this in the past, and uh, the law to to be a pedagogue to lead us, you know, to show mm-hmm. us our need of the Savior and to lead us to Christ. We've got to have that. And then the law is a rule of life for Christians. Okay, mm-hmm. we we need that. But there's a, a dimension of the law too to restrain evil. You know, the absolutely. law. I agree. That needs no. to be proclaimed, and I think the church has grown timid and intimidated of looking at our culture as John the Baptist looked at Herod and said, you cannot have your brother's wife. I think we've lost that. I think we've lost our Mm -hmm. nerve. I think you're right. I'm probably, I'm probably one of those that's lost my nerve. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I mean, we all are. uh, We all are. We just, I think we've drifted along so far that it's hard to kind of stop and take measure of just how well, I, th- I we think that maybe we're confused <laughs> as to how to do that. You know, there's some who say, that, like, the culture's got to be controlled by Christians, and Christians have to make all the laws, and anyone who doesn't conform to our uh, the, uh, a Christian concept of how, what, what civil laws should be like is, is or, or, or even public rights, civic rights that identify mm-hmm. us as a, as a Christian society. Uh, <clears throat> Those kinds of things, I, I don't think, are, are New Testament. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that is creating a kind of continuity from Israel that, is, that I don't see on the pages yeah. of the New Testament. I'm not sure that I'm able, able to articulate it as well as I want to articulate it one day. But I, I see the church as willing to suffer, the church as preaching the gospel, the church then as transforming the entire culture through the preaching of the gospel, through suffering for it. Mm -hmm. And that had the transforming effect. And I think we've got to be willing to do that again. Yeah, without a doubt. And and all three uses of the law. We need to call people to account for the way they conduct themselves uh, in civil society. I I think that Biden needs to be called to account for his approval of abortion. Mm -hmm. Here he is on Ash Wednesday having ashes on his head, and at the same time he's saying he'll veto any kind of of measure that makes it that that interrupts the reproductive health of women. Yeah. What a what a corrupt kind of statement to call a baby in the womb made in the image of God a full person to reduce it to the reproductive health of women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I I think that need, he needs to be called out. I, and I hope yeah. that his bishops will call him out. Yeah. On it, no, uh, I I agree with and, that, and and this is a this is a, a a a kind of a murky area to sort out. I don't have it all clear in my own mind. I, we did this pre conference on Christian nationalism, yeah. what we should think about it, you know. And I, I 
talked about its promises and perils because I see both. And I'm not even sure on the whole definition and whose definition ought to obtain here. But going back to what you said earlier about the foundation on which the Enlightenment rationalism arose, that foundation was from Christianity. That foundation was from a right understanding of the law and the gospel and the proclamation of that. And I don't think we can get to Thomas Jefferson. I don't mind Thomas Jefferson helping to write our laws if it's the Thomas Jefferson who was standing on the foundation that came out of the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, but to, yeah. He wanted to get rid of the supernatural stuff, so he reinvented the Bible. But nevertheless, the moral principles that right. were there, he wouldn't have believed those moral principles if the law had not been preached. He Unless believed, he was convinced, oh, these things are good for human relationships. This is the way we ought to live. That's right. So I mean, it, it, even he, if he disobeyed some of them, he, he still, still believed that that was the way it should be. He done. felt there ought to be a Bible. You know, yeah. I mean, it was what he did was heretical, no doubt about that. But today, we don't even have that foundation. We got folks saying, no, no, this is what we ought to be. This is what we ought to do, and yeah, we separate ourselves from any kind of absolute standard, yeah. anything that can govern our thinking. And, and eventually, even though we think that rationalism is, we think that because we're scientific and because now we have evolution and we can explain human things and we can predict how humanity should, should move, we think that we have found something that can give us hope, even in the absence of God, we haven't. No, no, no. And, we, and, and that, that absence of a foundation is, is going to be corrupting and we're going to see greater and greater brutality that's right. And, and so on, on the one hand, the Bible teaches us that government is a good gift of God. I don't think it's a necessary evil. I think it's a good gift of God and that governors are accountable to God, whether yes. they acknowledge him or not. And so we need to understand that. But a second thing is that it's not a question of whether or not we're going to have a religious foundation. It's a question of which one. Yeah. Are we going to have a godless religious foundation? And it's become increasingly clear to me over the last several years, if we don't think, if, if we think it's a secularism versus religion, we're not reading it right. Look at the way the secularists are operating. They have greater religious fervor. Yeah, great. Yeah. They have they have their excommunication principles. You know, <laughs> they have That's their right. rituals. They, they have their sacraments. And, it, and so it's not a question of uh, whether... It's a question of which. Which one are we going to have? And I want to argue for a Christian understanding of the world, of government, that recognizes minority rights, that doesn't try to coerce the conscience. All of the things that those who hear uh, Christians talking about uh, political realities and agendas, they fear that, oh, man, you're just looking for a theocracy where your group gets to be in charge. No, 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 no. I think if we do it, according to my understanding of the Bible— it's going to be a, a place where those who, whose consciences will not bow to Christ are not going to be executed because of that. Yeah. They're going to be able to live in a civil society that they will praise God for if they had any sense about them and understanding that they should. Yeah. And, and one day in eternity, they will recognize that they were given opportunities that they did not take. Yeah. And it will be a judgment against them. Uh, and for those of us who did not set forth those things, we will, I'm sure, have some degree of sanctifying lamentate, lamentation mm-hmm. about those things yeah. when we see them in the light of Christ. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's got to be a part of being made like him, for we shall see him as he is. Yeah. Don't you look forward to that, being holy like Jesus? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, and we- I think that, yeah, I think that seeing him as he is Boy, how much is involved in that? Seeing him as he is, Mm -hmm. we shall be like him. Everyone that has this hope in him then purifies himself even as he himself is pure. Yeah. So it it means that we embrace his concept of righteousness. We embrace his concept of holiness. We embrace his concept of what it means to be fully submissive to God. That is what the perfect order of sanctification will be. And that that is what we should be trying to move ourselves toward and the world toward. Amen. Amen. So... When I see thee as thou art, love thee from unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Yeah. And that's going to be glorious. Yes. Uh, well, Tom, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. I want to continue it, uh, but we got to stop the recording oh. of it because uh, we need to, to be Oh, were they recording this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just praise God for you. I thank God for the gifts he's given you, your stewardship of those gifts, the grace he's given you, and I, I cannot express how thrilled I am 
that uh, a generation of students who have the opportunity to learn from you will be able to take these things that God's taught you and process them themselves for greater usefulness in their king, in the kingdom of God Amen. in their lifetime. So thank you so much to for God all that you're doing. Glory. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thanks for joining us today on the Sword and Trial. If we can do anything for you at Founders, please let us know. Uh, if you like this podcast, share it. Let other people know about it. And uh, check out the various resources that we have at founders.org.